Bem, então, bom dia a todos. Um, vamos então dar início a esta sessão, a segunda, não, acho que já é a terceira da manhã, não é? Isto já vai amanhã, já vai, já vai longa. Um, we will be start the third session of this morning. Um, we have uh, four presentations and um, each presenter has 15 minutes in order to give some time for the debate, okay? So I will be strict for, with the time, sorry. <laughs> And we can start by Sidney. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce, yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> But I think that you can present yourself, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know how to switch to the other one. Do we have? Oh. Um. So, um, hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Yebnam Shoher. I am from Istanbul Technical University. Um, we are actually two people who is working on this project, me and my colleague Ipek, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Uh, she is a PhD candidate in uh, urban and regional planning and I am from architectural design and I finished my PhD recently. This project is not uh, our individual research projects but a joint um, question that we asked and uh, this is a, just the start of an ongoing project, hopefully. And uh, the question that we asked was in terms of the right to use the city, what does it mean that some parts of urban space were closed, in our case uh, with the excuse of redevelopment, uh, for long stretches of time and for the people who are living around it and watching a construction site every day for an indefinite time. A construction by itself starts with deconstruction, deconstruction of everyday life habits, patterns, previous lives, previous uses and experiences. And it signifies a transformation, and during the process, contingency becomes a part of the everyday life. And well, our case study, Tarlebashi, uh, is a regeneration project, is one of the urban redevelopment sites of Istanbul, resurfacing uh, all the questions that I asked a minute ago, and it continues for almost 10 years. Well, in larger scale, this topic has been discussed among academic circles and popular media. Uh, in the meantime, everyday life finds itself ways to reclaim, repurpose, and rebelong, of course. And our aim in this paper was first to trace the effects of the recurring displacements and to document new ways in which people invent methods of existing, uh, taking root again, and reclaiming the space. Okay, I will just uh, do this very quickly. Uh, urban redevelopment and gentrification are not new topics for the, for the global cities and also not for Istanbul. And Talibashi is uh, one of an important uh, example of gentrification projects and it has more or less the same storyline as many other uh, deteriorated urban center neighborhoods. And the neighborhood is located in the very center of the city. If I may, this is Taksim Square and the, uh, the famous uh, Gezi Park that uh, hosted an important uh, uh, pr uh, urban protest of the city. And this is the main commercial access, Istiklal Street, uh, which is connecting the old city, the historical peninsula, to the newly developing a developed areas and the uh, central business district of Istanbul uh, since 16th century. And this is uh, the boulevard opened in the late 80s and this is the project area which has been under construction for more or less 10 years. Well, um, this is a very nice uh, description of the, the, the recent situation of the neighborhood by Asu Aksoy. Uh, with its streets full of 19th century houses and abandoned Greek Orthodox churches, historic Tarlebashi is a neighborhood where Kurdish, who came from the southeast of Turkey, Local Romani people and African immigrants migrated illegally are living side by side and today it's another district where the demolitions have already started for the purpose of renewal. 
Uh, well, of course, this was not always the case. Uh, Pera district, like all the neighborhood that Talibashi is in, is a uh, is a is representing the cosmopolitan culture of Istanbul since 16th century. And Pera district became increasingly popular by foreigners, and uh, especially around the turn of the 19th to 20th century, with its embassy buildings. And they were already followed by buildings with contemporary functions of that time, such as hotels, passages, and cinemas. And as an outcome of the increasing popularity, uh, the rents and the demand for housing rose, and Tarla Bashi, where we are working, started supplying new apartments and small businesses, mostly managed by non-Muslim owners. And while Pera was inhabited mostly by middle to upper middle class population, and Tarla Bashi was more middle to lower middle class, providing services to the Pera households. Uh, although Istanbul was more or less neglected after the foundation of Turkish Republic, uh, as a part of the Ottoman legacy, uh, which was neglected. Uh, after the 1930s, and with an increasing uh, pace, uh, became again important. And uh, around the 40s, with the first redevelopment projects made by the area, it also followed uh, some traumatic events that affected the non-Muslim community, such as wealth tax and the, uh, the, the collective pillage uh, incidents of September 1955. Um, according to the law of the wealth tax, seen as an extension of the fast Turkification politics of the single party government, non-Muslim members of the society were obliged to pay high taxes or face harsh sanctions, and these are examples from the daily newspapers showing the members of the community uh, selling their assets in the auctions to pay those high taxes. And of course this resulted uh, with the loss of the community and a lot of migrations to, to abroad. And all through the 80s, Istanbul faced uh, the rapid extension of the city with uh, internal immigration. Uh, while internal migration was causing the immense growth of population, neither available housing nor public transport systems, the infrastructure of the city was not enough to provide shelter, and Talibashi, with his ambiguous uh, ownership issues with a lot of abandon, abandoned houses, was of course uh, an important target of migration uh, for the uh, for the newcomers. And during the 80s, uh, another big development project was implemented to the neighborhood. As we can see, this neighborhood, which was a more coherent, uh, middle to lower middle class houses, uh, were separated with the opening of the new boulevard. And this project is still being criticized today uh, for dividing and segregating the, the area into these in between spaces which are fed by the, the commercial and cultural area of the main axis, main historical axis, and letting the part of uh, the, the inhabitants being segregated and uh, distant from the, the rest of the, the city life. Wow. Uh, well, the aim of the, our research has been to deliver an unbiased and objective account of uh, people's everyday lives. And maybe I need to skip another part. No, but all through the 90s, after this development project, uh, the rest of the, uh, the neighborhood was uh, gentrifying by the, the free market uh, but after 2000, with the new neoliberal urban politics of, of uh, Turkey, um, the new legislation enabled uh, a big project uh, to be implemented harshly by uh, collaborations between public authorities and uh, big companies, so that it's uh, not anymore a, a self-regulated gentrification project, but a, a, a capital uh, intervened uh, a sudden, uh, sudden situation. And today, on the left side, the neighborhood is facing a new uh, commercial housing project. Uh, nine building blocks, including the street network in between, are isolated from the daily life of the neighborhood. Buildings are partially demolished and historic facades are standing with the supporting structures to, uh, to maintain this look at the end. This is an image from the, the housing commercials promoting the uh, suitable payment options.
for the newcomers. Uh, as a method, uh, this study aimed to explore the, the coping strategies the inhabitants around the area. Uh, it used a qualitative approach which is based on a case study in which the accounts of the inhabitants of the area is collected. Uh, as Creswell argues, that case studies are needed if the researcher explores in depth a program, an event, an activity, a process, or one or more individuals. Therefore, to understand both the process itself and the responses of the shop owners in the project area, we designed a case study that took uh, the place between January and February 2018 and covered the surrounding streets of the project area. You can see more or less the interviews places. And Uh, the aim of the research has been to deliver an unbiased and objective account of people's everyday lives. Therefore, an approach closer to descriptive site than a more interpretive one was decided on. And in order to simplify and focus on some specific characteristics of the data and to interpret and conceptualize the conversations, uh, they were coded with analytical coding. And our approach was highly open without any designated agenda beforehand. But even though any preset categories were uh, not derived from literature, we used our own keywords. And we attached to the coping strategies of the inhabitants uh, to code the interviews. And, well, there were some overarching themes like the re-belonging, repurposed, and within that there were identification, authorization itself, detachment, and stigmatization of the neighborhood that were uh, recurring. And, well, to, to summarize, during the interviews, the most prevailing category has been ambiguity, which directs people to recreate their positions or to try to find a position that would fit in the future structure of the area. The interviewees claim that nobody informed them about an exact date of completion or what would happen to the immediate surroundings and there is no future regulation for the, for the surrounding area. A high degree of anticipation was prevalent among interviewees, however, mostly accompanied by a slight loss of hope towards an ambiguous future and the participants were expecting something which they did not know either positive or negative. Therefore, in most cases, an acceptance of the trans transient state they are in arose as the most common coping strategy. Uh, the second category was disassociation. Uh, they were authorizing the, the newcomers, uh, both the, the potential newcomers of the, the area and the immigrants that they came uh, after uh, the other ones left uh, for the, uh, as others, as not from within the community. The third category is disruption. And uh, when they are talking about even from a uh, recent past, it seems like a, uh, a long lost time and a long time ago. Um, they were, for example, referring uh, the, the customers that they lost as good families, whereas the, the new ones are uh, strangers. And the fourth category is adaptation, uh, and it includes also the functions of the shops that have been changing in the last 10 years over and over again, and changing their own profiles. And uh, as a final word, uh, we are, uh, we have been coming across with a lot of contemporary researchers uh, regarding the area, which uh, were stating that the, the process is inevitable and the everyday life patterns and the cultural accumulation of the area is lost. Uh, but we like to look at this uh, as maybe young researchers uh, as an area where the remaining uh, inhabitants who adapted themselves as the reminiscence of the past uh, which are going to uh, carry it to the future. Uh, and we like to use the term social mix here. In the next phase of Tarlebushi, the remaining small establishments will be the part of this new hybrid social life as the remnants of the history of Tarlebushi that is interwoven with disruption uh, in all its history and uh, the new temporalities. Thank you for listening. This is this one, the last one. This one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 
Hello, my name is Gökçe Sanul, uh, and I'm a PhD researcher in Free University of uh, Brussels. Uh, I'm almost at the end of my PhD, and today I will present you a case study from my PhD, uh, which is about alternative theatres. So in this presentation, I will focus on alternative theatres in Istanbul, uh, which sprouted in 2010s by changing the older dynamics of the theatre scene of Turkey, and I argue that also they open up new spaces. Uh, I will ask what are the ways in which alternative theatres create new cultural infrastructures uh, in today's Istanbul and how they open up space for country public spheres in the neoliberalizing city. So first I will start with uh, explaining what does it mean being an alternative in the wider theatre scene of Istanbul. Then I will mention their organizational tactics and I will focus briefly on alternative theatres joint initiative and finally, I will relate all of this to this idea of opening up new spaces. Uh, so in Istanbul, also theater scene consists of private and public theaters, and public theaters re refer to state theaters and municipal theaters. Uh, in terms of private theaters, there are only uh, one uh, state fund uh, exists. It's a subsidy given by Minister of Culture. Uh, and it's not a um, uh, regular fund, so it creates an absence of public funding for private theatres, and it leads to a lack of financial support and infrastructure for these theatres. Uh, and alternative uh, is a debated term also among the theatre circles, but there's a consensus that it refers uh, to the groups which stayed outside of the main mainstream, which refer to the publicly funded theatres and commercialized private uh, theatres. So we can define alternative theatres as the group, independent groups who use experimental approaches for dramaturgy, playwriting and uh, staging strategies. Uh, and what um, makes them specific is that they use uh, unconventional theatre spaces, as also you can see in this picture, mainly they transform the old apartments or uh, uh, ateliers. Uh, and they are black box stages uh, having a seating capacity uh, approximately for uh, 50 people or at most uh, 100, uh, 100 people. Uh, and they have a collective, collective working structure, not a hierarchical structure. Uh, and also one important aspect is that they have, their income uh, is not based on ticket uh, uh, revenues only, but they have a mixed funded, uh, funding strategy that I call, uh, so it refers to income uh, that they transfer from their uh, other jobs because still they are working as uh, in uh, academia or um, architects or lawyers. Uh, and also they are organizing some collaborative um, support events uh, for each other for raising some income to sustain their space in the city. Uh, a previous uh, research also shows that uh, between 82, uh, where the roots of this alternative theatre movement uh, dated back, till 2015, more than 200 independent theatre groups were founded, and except for a few examples, all of these groups have been active in Istanbul. Uh, so here in this map also you can see with the red um, dots, is Alternative theatres mainly they uh, locate in Beyoğlu neighbourhood, uh, which is also known as the cultural hub of uh, Istanbul. Uh, but again, their specificity is that uh, they are located in the back streets because of the affordable rent price. But despite of it, uh, they move to other uh, places or they just close down because they cannot afford it. And so based on these uh, common problems, uh, in 2011, they funded uh, a Alternative Theatres Joint Initiative. It's a local network of solidarity uh, to support each other uh, and to find solutions for their common problems uh, and to increase their visibility in the city. But uh, it's not a formal um, model of organization. So also all of my interviewees uh, express that it's a process of uh, thinking together and it's not a formal agreement or contract that obliges these groups to be together. Uh, so, based on this background, uh, now I want to give an answer for this question, how they open up a space in the city. And when I say opening up uh, a space, also I should refer the theoretical setting, uh, which comes uh, with the thought of emancipation uh, in the 
works of uh, Jacques Rancière. Uh, and this approach sees the city as a site of political encounter, interruption and experimentation. Uh, and Mustafa Diketch puts it, uh, politics is about questioning, resisting, challenging and disrupting the established order of, th of things by opening up spaces for the verification and enactment of equality. So also I am referring to this approach and uh, my empirical findings about these theatres uh, indicate three dimensions uh, that they open up these spaces. First, providing space for coexistence. Second is making visible the undocumented history. And third one is creating a translocal uh, speciality. Uh, so with the first one, space for coexistence, I refer again uh, to the solidarity relations. So first uh, aspect of these relations, as I uh, expressed with this alternative uh, theater joint initiative, that they try to make uh, visible each other uh, and support each other. But also, uh, besides all of these groups who formed this initiative, they adopted a mission to give a, a space for the other independent groups. Uh, and as, of, as one, of my, one of the interviewees says, um, it's one of the opening purposes of the stages was to able to share it with other groups, I mean the ones who are not very visible, audible, who cannot make themselves understood in other stages, or just cannot find spaces. Naturally, we try to open our space to all of these uh, groups. Uh, in terms of their public, sure, also it uh, forms a limit for them, because uh, it's the, their audience, young, educated from middle and upper middle classes, and among them, university students have a remarkable presence. Uh, and um, according to observations of my interviewees, uh, it consists of uh, 5,000 people. But what is specific about these alternative groups is that they also involve this audience uh, into their solidarity uh, actions, actually. Uh, for example, they can organize a, a campaign for a southeastern city in Turkey, uh, or if there is a case of censorship uh, or interrogation for one of the uh, artists, also they started a campaign in social media and also attract the attention of this audience. Uh, so through these actions, I argue that also they nurture an uh, urban citizenship um, idea and also open up a new space uh, in the city. So I also call this as a solidary publicness, which is based on solidarity relations uh, through which audience can freely share social political concerns um, due to some common problems uh, in the country. Uh, and again, this quote um, expresses it very clearly. Uh, it says, if our space exists, they become a living space for the audience. They come to your theater and to the next bookstore or the exhibition in the next corner. By doing this, you contribute to form a space that, that, uh, that people having an opposing view can breathe and live. When people come to our space, they say, I am not alone. 50 other people are also here tonight with me. Something is going wrong in this country, but there are tens of hundreds of other people who feel uncomfortable with this uh, situation like me. Uh, second dimension uh, is making visible the undocumented history. So with this alternative theaters movement, we see first time the emergence of local text writers. Uh, here I want to say that in the maybe theater history of Turkey, 60s when the political theater movement started, and also in 80s uh, when this uh, alternative theaters um, movement started first, mainly um, pieces plays, they were translated from Western text and they were playing this text. But uh, in this moment, uh, these alternative theaters, they actually write their own text, which, uh, which is about also the marginalized groups uh, and which reflects the diversity of urban population and their problems uh, in this text. So also through this, again, I argue that they contribute to this urban citizenship practices. So a previous research about these alternative theaters uh, also shows that alternative theaters differ from the older generation who have educated with the nation state ideology and who have the habitus of a Republican artist. Uh, from unidentified murders to the violence cases during the custody, from femicides to sex workers, from military coup to crime against humanities in jails and Saturday mothers, they touch upon several social political issues being part of the dark side of the Turkish history and have not taken place uh, in the theater 
stages. Uh, also, I want to concretize it uh, with an example of a theater play called uh, Trace. Uh, it explains um, a three-layered story which took place in the same house located in uh, Beolo, uh, intertwined the forced eviction of the Greek Orthodox minorities in 6-7 uh, September 1955 from this house through the story of two sisters, uh, the story of Ahmed who rented this house in order to escape after the military coup 12 um, September 1980, and a story of a transvestite living and working in the same area uh, in 2000s. So through this kind of stories, uh, they make visible undocumented history, and this also constitutes the urban character of this movement uh, and underlies my argument that they nurture urban citizenship practices, which is also based on this publicness that I mentioned, um, which comes with the solidarity relations among themselves. Uh, and last dimension is uh, they create a translocal space uh, of engagement um, so for explaining this also, I should go back to uh, the end of uh, 80s, where the globalization uh, process started and accelerated uh, in 90s. So the role of first international uh, theater festival in Istanbul in 1989, and uh, then in 2010, uh, European Capital of Culture. So this process also create an environment that these actors, theaters, uh, groups can be connected uh, with the foreign actors. Uh, and what we see today, uh, they are really collaborating uh, with theater groups uh, from maybe Germany, UK, and also they are building some long-term uh, projects with them. And also we see the existence of um, foreign funders like Goethe Institute, British Consul Council. Uh, so this overall, um, also in the case of an absence of public funding uh, from Turkish state, also, it opens them up a space in the city that they can uh, express also uh, today's realities. Thank you. Um, hello, um, my name is Lydia and um, I'm officially trained as an architect, uh, first in Germany and later on in, in Belgium and Brussels. I originally come from Greece and um, as far as I understood until now, I'm maybe the only, not, <laughs> not only Greek, there was a, a Skype, uh, a Greek uh, Skype, but um, Maybe I'm the only not PhD researcher and I'm a freelance architect practitioner. Um, <laughs> no. Um, anyway, so I'm going to show today some things uh, of my practice. Uh, actually, it started, it's a project which started as a, uh, my master thesis in Brussels. And later on, it, uh, after an open call from the Flemish government in Brussels, it received the funding to be realized as a community project with uh, a series of workshops in a precise neighborhood. Um, so I usually like to work in an in interdisciplinary way with a lot of different practitioners who are into making, but also into thinking, uh, cooking, and coming together, practicing and performing. Um, and I, I'm an advocate of collective authorship. I don't believe my work is my work because I am based on so much inspiration um, and so many people have been part of my projects or our projects. Um, exactly, so on the left is my master thesis booklet. It's called Home is Where You Are Not. Um, and on the right side is the project I'm currently developing in Brussels. It's called Public Salon Public, which is a word play uh, quite common in Brussels. For the ones who don't know, Brussels is a bilingual city. Um, so people speak Dutch and French, or 
should speak or should understand. Um, so the title has the middle, it's a system often found in street names. The name is in the middle and then you have um, the street or avenue in both languages. So it's the public living room actually. Um, so we were talking yesterday with a couple of people how often our thesis is a kind of psychoanalysis for us, uh, for ourselves, because it's a topic we want to really understand what we think about. Um, and as I have moved a lot in the last 10 years uh, in many different countries, and each time with the moving, I had to also understand who I am and what I'm doing in this place. And this is also very characteristic about Brussels, where so many people come and go. Um, so for me, it was uh, very important to understand what, what is our identity and what do we define as home. Um, home is a very immaterial concept and it's something that is not really used in architectural terms. Um, um, but also, what we find in Brussels, maybe it's people who are constantly on the move. It's a a process I called permanent uprootedness, like a tree that you lift and its roots are in the air and are trying to find fertile ground to settle. Uh, but people come for two years and then move on to another place and to another place. So for me, it's this identity which is constantly in becoming and how do you define it uh, in the process of homing. At the same time, I wanted to give, to, to expand the architectural discipline into um, invisible processes and uh, performative processes and embodied processes uh, and give credit to the user, not only to the architect as the one who makes architecture. Um, um, and maybe last but not least, uh, the idea of diversity or super diversity uh, as a diversification of diversity, that we cannot belong to only one category. Uh, we're not Belgians or Greeks, uh, but also women or men, educated or not. Um, this is a, the idea of intersectionality often found also in feminist critique, um, which comes often back to my research. Um, so this is a quote by Karina van Herk, uh, which I really like, it says, home is a practice through which the different poles of human existence are negotiated. It's a production uh, out of the creative self and the mere reproduction of prescribed forms, uh, forms of activity. It's a semi-productive area uh, active between the active production and passive reproduction between subjective and obje objective culture. So this is important that uh, we are not only coming from our culture and representing a very solid and fixed idea of who we are, but uh, we always constantly interpret it at the same time. Uh, so it's culture is evolving constantly and uh, yeah. Um. Okay, so for my uh, research, I followed four different approaches. Uh, the first one was uh, theoretical readings, which was basically trying to establish a bibliography of what is a home, going through many different disciplines, like memory studies, heritage studies, uh, architecture, history, cultural critique, etc. So the question is, is home physical or mental? Is home a place or a time? Is home in the past or in the future? Is home here or there? Um, so in this sense, um, home is rather a heterotopian idea of I'm here, but at the same time I'm dreaming of another place, uh, which I don't know if it's in the past or in the future. Uh, it's, I don't know if it's where I'm coming from or where I'm heading to. Um, and uh, at the same time, um, many people say, um, or I found at least myself saying that I go back home when I go to Greece, but then I'm flying back to Brussels, so I go back home, so where, where is home in the end? Home is where you are not, 
It's a, it's a quote I found in a text by Agnes Heller, which is a, a Hungarian philosopher, and I adopted it as a title of my master thesis. Um, so um, an important, or where this research led, uh, was to define the concept or to find encounter the concept of memory structures which are objects or embodied practices which uh, represent a memory and through that an identity. Um, they're usually overseen by architecture as they're so minuscule um, but this is what makes for me a performative and relational architecture. On the right side you, you see an object, it's called a memory jack. Um, it was used um, I think in indigenous uh, American cultures, and it's an object where people used to stick, w w or w when a person died, uh, his relatives used to stick with the material, um, different objects which belonged to this person, and this memory jack uh, represented the essence of the deceased, but at the same time it was a representation because it's the idea, the projection other people had of who was this person who has passed away. Uh, the second approach angle is a personal mapping. Um, I did this in my own apartment that I was sharing with another three flatmates. Um, and I analyzed the practices we had to um, ap appropriate the space. Uh, also the aesthetic and embodied references we had towards objects. For example, on the left side, um, hanging our laundry in Brussels and hanging our laundry in a village in Greece. Uh, and on the right side, it's uh, an index um, of traces found on the side. It's uh, a list of all the pins used in the house to pin different posters. Uh, these were collected over five years. I was not there. Uh, I came on the, the fifth year in this house, but uh, many people had left traces and the next inhabitants reinterpreted those traces. Uh, the third approach angle was a series of interviews I did with immigrant people who lived in Brussels. I reached them through different networks such as Facebook groups or uh, common friends we had. I uh, had more or less 10 interviews with people of different nationalities and it was either at home or in an outside space. Um, and they, they were not structured at all. It was very, a very narrative process of an interview and I asked them to define what is home for them. I was focused in the domestic territory and how they uh, inhabit this domestic territory. And uh, as a tool, I used a sketch, so I asked the people to sketch their own houses while they were talking about them. Um, and I think it's a very important tool because people put their own histories in those sketches. They have very different representation styles. For example, this is a couple who share the same flat but they, I think it's remarkable the different degrees of um, detailing. Uh, the final angle was the design proposal. As architects, you always imagine and want to build and propose things which are almost never done. Uh, so I proposed three prototypes um, which combined different elements I had traced in this process of what is home, what represents home. Um, I've located three sites in a neighborhood very close to the center of Brussels called, called Saint Jost in, in Dutch and Saint Jost in French. Um, yeah, so for the example, um, this is one which combined a sleeping cabin with an eating area. This is a playground. And this is maybe my favorite one. It's a very huge table because the table was an object found in many cultures, but it had different um, attributes in every culture, like a, a Japanese low table or a Turkish coffee table or our idea of a counter, for example. This table was really taking over the neighborhood, climbing over buildings, streets, uh, and inviting people to appropriate it. Uh, they were not supposed to be museum pieces. They were supposed to be activated uh, in my imagination. <laughs> so the, there was, after two years, there was an open call in Brussels for neighborhood projects and I applied with an adapted plan of the master thesis. Uh, in the meanwhile, in my head, the concept of support or memory structures has 
evolved in the concept of support structures. It was after I have read this amazing book by Celine Condorelli, which I have with me. If everyone wants to take a look afterwards, uh, she defines support structure as the architecture or the material objects which support um, human interaction and social exchanges. Um, she goes a lot uh, into the history of art, exhibition techniques, um, and scaffolding. And um, I use the concept of support structures also in my communication materials, like the flyers um, for the project, um, both in aesthetic terms, but also in technical terms. For example, these are two flyers. They are printed with a technique called terizography. Uh, they have, so you print one layer, one color. Um, in this case, it's golden. I also have with me some flyers if you want to have a look. The golden layer is the architecture, and then the red layer that you print on top is the interaction and imagination. So I started doing uh, the, a series of workshops about what is home and how can we construct in the public space a public living room that represents various homes. Um, I do it as a freelancer and external collaborator with the University of Karlovan and the Flemish Community Center. We started those workshops in a park in St. Jost, this neighborhood. There was a pavilion which was closed temporarily, temporarily over the winter. Um, excuse me. Um, and for example, you see on the left side, uh, even the park guards were coming sometimes and giving ideas of what is a home. Um, and on the right side, there was a moment where a woman was showing us uh, pictures of birds singing in the neighborhood, or we were talking a lot about birds and trees and sustainability and ecology, something which also opened up my mind into not only human interactions, but also other than human um, relations. We did a sound mapping and a video mapping as well. Uh, and all the ideas that we were talking about, we started creating an online archive. Um, for example, um, what are the importance of trees? How can we use um, uh, parking spaces as um, social spaces? Is a cafe, uh, which is a private space, is it a public living room or not? Um, in the end, or where we are currently, we decided to do a community oven for the neighborhood. Uh, we, st we started doing it in the park, so our workspace is outside in the park. We had not really a plan of how to do it, but we decided to experiment outside. And then after four days of construction, we moved it to the square. Uh, it's a square very populated uh, with, I have to say that the um, neighborhood has a lot of Turkish and Moroccan inhabitants. Um, it's difficult to say if they're immigrants or not because in Brussels many people are naturalized. This means they have the Belgian identity, uh, um, citizenship. Uh, at the same time, this neighborhood has a Turkish mayor which creates a lot of conflicts and identity politics. Um, but the oven also is um, is an image that people from those countries have very present in their memory. So it was quite a successful moment to, to reach people. Uh, they were also enthusiastic about the bread and then they started also grilling aubergines. It happened during the Ramadan, so it was a very sensitive moment of waiting until the sunset to eat together. Um, and last Sunday, we did another action at the street party, it was organized by a Flemish community. Uh, it's on the right side. Um, it was very different. It was so quiet. People were not engaged at all to participate. These were the only two people that helped us make bread. Uh, but I chose the photo also because if you see the man with the suit, this is the mayor of the neighborhood. So it's a high visit. Um, and what I have understood those months that I'm doing the project is also, it's so powerful to be independent and in between institutions and in between communities. And you also act a bit as their 
um, psychoanalysts, they all come to you and say their problems and complain all the time. So you have a very sensitive position. And at the same time, um, my question at the moment is how to, because I understand I have a privilege as a cultural worker, I can do an oven and a barbecue in the neighborhood, but Moroccan people complain they cannot do a barbecue because the Turkish mayor doesn't allow them to put fire. So the moment I understand I have a privilege, how can I pass it over to other communities? Thank you. Okay, hello, I'm apologize me, but I'm speaking Spanish, so but the PowerPoint will be in English, so sorry. Muy bien. Eh, lo que os voy a presentar ahora es un estudio de caso presentado bueno, dentro de mi tesis doctoral, en la cual se centra en los encuentros sensoriales en la ciudad de Lleida. Como podéis ver en la imagen, se sitúa en toda la parte del castillo y toda la parte alrededor del casca, bueno, del al plano urbano de la ciudad de Lleida. Hay que entender que eh, la tesis está basada dentro de la eh, educación eh, universitaria, por lo tanto, en muchos casos la, el sistema universitario sigue habiendo un sistema homogeneizador de pruebas donde la cual se busca siempre la memorización y estandarización de los contenidos curriculares. Por lo tanto, los alumnos lo que hacen más es estar pendientes de memorizar patrones concretos para luego presentarlos en los exámenes y olvidarse, en este caso. La, el Espacio Europeo de Educación Superior se creó con la finalidad de crear nuevos contenidos curriculares que sean más coherentes con la realidad que vivimos. Y, por lo tanto, el, bueno, creo que en este caso la educación universitaria debería ir por este camino. A su vez, como formadores dentro del sistema universitario, hay que creer en nuevas maneras de formación dentro de la docencia universitaria que sean más coherentes con la realidad que vivimos. Y eso implica que el docente genere situaciones de aprendizaje que creen conexiones con su día a día, no simplemente con algo estandarizado. Por lo tanto, no podemos entender un currículum estático y teorético, teo, teorizado, sino entender que la vida es un cambio constante, por lo tanto, siempre habrá movimiento y pasarán cosas diferentes. Aún así, ¿cómo creamos, no como docentes, cómo creamos o, situaciones dentro del territorio que nos acerquen a esta realidad que nos planteamos y, por lo tanto, presentar un currículum que sea coherente con la realidad que vivimos? Hay que entender que la realidad que, como la concedimos está basada por las percepciones y cómo nosotros nos relacionamos con todo nuestro alrededor. Por lo tanto, hay que tener en claro de que hay factores biológicos, contextuales, sociales y culturales que hacen que el global de toda la situación se entienda. Lo que os voy a presentar aquí es la introducción de mi doctorado, en la cual se basa en un estudio de caso dentro de la, de la formación universitaria y, concretamente, dentro del grado de Educación Social. ¿Por qué? Porque creo que dentro del marco educativo los educadores son uno de los puntos claves dentro de todo el sistema universitario y dentro del sistema de dar respuesta a todos los cambios constantes que vive la sociedad. Por lo tanto, lo que intento dentro de esta docencia es utilizar la sensorialidad y la espacialidad como ejes para trabajar toda la docencia universitaria. ¿En qué me baso? Me baso, primeramente, por el tema del third space, que se basa a partir del third social. Hay que entender que el third plantea tres, tres espacios, tanto el percibido, el concebido y el vivido, y que luego social los recoge y los transforma, hablando del first, second and third space. Entender que el first space es el espacio más descriptivo, el objetivo en este caso. El second space es el segundo en el cual se da una conceptualización de todo lo que se vive y apostar por una docencia universitaria que tenga una dimensión del third space, ¿no? donde todo tenga cabida, donde haya nuevas aproximaciones y otras formas de vida que sean coherentes con la realidad que estamos viviendo. A su vez, aparte de espacialidad, cómo la sensorialidad nos está generando nuevos inputs. Y esto es muy importante en el sentido de que 
Vivimos en un caos sensorial, implica que simultáneamente estamos rodeados de sentidos, de emociones, y estas las canalizamos con nuestro cuerpo. Por lo tanto, hay que entender, hacer ese proceso de entender cómo nosotros nos relacionamos con nuestro alrededor. ¿no? Por lo tanto, entender cómo se crean estas relaciones entre el espacio y nuestro cuerpo. David Hobbes, por ejemplo, es uno de los referentes en el cual plantea este sensory tour, en el cual cómo la sensualidad ayuda también a otras disciplinas a darle a abertura a, a estas y, por lo tanto, entender más desde una globalidad. Entender también que estamos basados en ritmos, ¿no? estos ritmos constantes de, de relación con el espacio. Todo esto, ¿cómo se hace o cómo planteo esta docencia? A partir de tres ejes. Una, que serían los espacios, na, o los, los espacios híbridos, el arte contemporáneo y las narrativas en sus espaciales. Estas tres herramientas que utilizo son para que los alumnos se planteen nuevas formas de vida. Por una parte, las narrativas sensoriales son instrumentos en los cuales los alumnos redactan de forma biográfica todo su proceso creativo a partir de diferentes experiencias que van viviendo en su día a día. Segundo, el arte contemporáneo, utilizarlo como herramienta de inclusividad. ¿Por qué? Porque plantea nuevas posibilidades y que cada uno, cada persona se sitúe de forma de, a partir de sus experiencias y sus relaciones. Y luego Libre Space, que se basa en Seiner, en, la, en el cual quiere romper un poco la dicotomía de clases magistrales en el cual el maestro habla, el alumno escucha y fin, sino establecer una sala horizontal en la cual, a partir de todas las experiencias, tanto que uno tiene como las que el público o los estudiantes tienen, crear aquí convergencias. Por lo tanto, estas serían las tres principales herramientas que luego se utilizan en este caso. Por lo tanto, resumiendo un poco lo que planteo en, en mi doctorado, es a partir de los estudiantes de segundo curso del grado de Educación Social, a partir de una metodología cualitativa de estudio de caso, ver qué genera el espacio y los sentidos a partir de los espacios híbridos y las narrativas de los alumnos. A partir de aquí, ¿cómo se plantea? ¿no? ¿Cómo se baja la concreción? En este caso, primeramente, lo que es importante es empezar en un contexto, empezar en la ciudad. Por lo tanto, los alumnos, sin decir nada, se les envía un correo y este correo con unas indicaciones y ese es el primer día de clase. Normalmente, los estudiantes están acostumbrados a empezar con una clase magistral en la cual se presenta la elaboración, se presenta qué topics o contents se hará y posteriormente se empieza. Bien, generar un cambio en la, en la docencia implica que ellos rompan o cambien un poco el chip, este chip de no ir a la universidad simplemente para adquirir un conocimiento y luego vomitarlo, ¿no? en este caso, entre comillas. Por lo tanto, en este curso se escogió el depósito del agua, eh, situado en el casco antiguo de la ciudad de Lleida, en la cual bueno, es un espacio sensorial y también patrimonial que es muy rico en su, en su proceso. A partir de aquí, los alumnos, el primer día de clase, se presentan todos ahí y ya tienen que registrar todo lo que perciben. Hay que entender que las percepciones no solamente son los cinco sentidos de ver, o escuchar, a, o a gustar, sino es abrirlo, muscularlo, táctil, ir más allá de lo que se entiende como cinco sentidos. Y a partir de aquí, explorar, explorar a ver qué pasa, qué les sucede, qué relaciones, qué vínculos hacen con su día a día. Y poco a poco empezaron a crear sus propias narrativas. ¿Qué busco? Busco sobre todo que abran la mente, ¿no? que open mind de, de situaciones, de experiencias, de ver cómo se relacionan con el contexto e ir más allá. Entender también que el depósito del agua estaba situado en el medio de la ciudad, por lo tanto, el alto nivel de migración también condiciona para ellos, ¿por qué? Porque no están habituados a ir a estos sitios, ¿no? Por lo tanto, se, incluso se sentían incómodos de no saber cómo relacionarse con el espacio, que esto es importante y más como educadores, futuros educadores sociales, ¿no? En este caso. Otra de las prácticas que se hizo o que se llevó a cabo fue las deriva sensorial. En este caso, se les dijo a la segunda semana ir a hacer una deriva en la cual la deriva consiste en divagar por el espacio sin un punto fijo, sino que a partir de aquí ir bueno, viendo a ver qué estímulo reciben, para luego trabajar en qué narraciones han emergido. Porque os tengamos un ejemplo, aquí aparecen temas de gentrificación, de turistificación y, por lo tanto, otros conceptos que luego complementan toda la experiencia que los alumnos tienen. 
A su vez, a partir de esa deriva, luego hay que entender que todas las derivas hay que transformarlas en una, en una cartografía. Entender que la cartografía siempre está regida por reglas sociales y reglas etnocentristas. ¿no? Quien hace el mapa manda, hace el discurso. Por lo tanto, aquí los alumnos tenían que hacer sus propios mapas. Pero no mapas estáticos o cerrados, sino buscando inputs que les ayuden a ser un poco más creativos o a, a generar nuevos procesos. En este caso, aquí se partió de una exposición que había en la Universidad de Lleida, que se llama Bibliotecas Insolentes en Cadernos Artivistas, que es una exposición itinerante por todo el mundo, que ahora está en Sao Paulo, en la cual son cuadernos de artistas que van trabajando y explorando nuevas formas de expresión y de generar creatividad. Por lo tanto, los alumnos, a partir de este estímulo y de la deriva, se crearon y se crearon estas producciones que veis aquí. Aquí... ¿Qué hay? El discurso. Discurso de qué he puesto, qué no he puesto, qué, qué he sentido, qué no he sentido y generar relaciones con los contenidos de la asignatura. No nos olvidemos que estamos siempre en geografía e historia. Por lo tanto, nuevas relaciones. En su caso, luego también hubo la expansión del arte contemporáneo. ¿Por qué el arte? Los he explicado un poco antes. El hecho de decir que partimos siempre de contenidos que abran la mente. Por lo tanto, se partió de la obra de Óscar Muñoz en la cual el artista colombiano, el que busca mucho el recuerdo y la relación con el, la persona, y por lo tanto los, los alumnos tuvieron la experiencia sensorial en esta en esa exposición de la Fundación Sorigué, que buscaba abrir la mente también a los alumnos y ver nuevas posibilidades narrativas. Fijaros que son diferentes actividades o procesos para que ellos, a partir de sus narrativas sensoriales, puedan expandir el, el conocimiento. A partir de aquí, ¿qué, qué, qué pasa con todo esto? ¿no? ¿O qué vamos a concluir? Aunque hay narraciones han salido como elemento importante en las investigaciones. Un elemento clave, sobre todo, es entender que ellos fue un hándicap muy grande empezar la docencia fuera de la universidad. Por lo tanto, como veis aquí algunas de sus voces nos hablan, ¿no? Being in the class in the public square of the center of the city was the last thing that I expect. Bueno, son algunas de las experiencias que no esperaban. Por ellos fue una fisura, un breaking, ¿no? En este caso, o no entendían la razón de por qué ge hacer geografía en educación social. Pues bien, era para abrir esta mente y entender que ellos son educadores de la calle. Por lo tanto, ellos van a tener que estar en el día a día con gente de la ciudad. Por lo tanto, entender esto. Estas voces que nos muestran, nos muestran como romper este, esta separación entre una realidad que se vive en la universidad y una realidad que se vive a la, a, la, a la ciudad, en este caso, y ver cómo ambas se pueden conectar y expandir y generar nuevos procedimientos. ¿eh? Entender cómo la espacialidad para ellos y los ritmos que aparecen en la ciudad son importantes para entender nuevos conceptos de vida o nuevas formas de vida. La deriva sensorial, por ejemplo, ¿qué les opuso? Les puso a entender otras posibilidades. Ellos están acostumbrados a siempre a hacer el mismo camino. Bien, haciendo la deriva se abrió el camino no está, y abrió nuevas posibilidades en este caso. Más cosas. Las otras voces también abren como la deriva sensorial abrió nuevas posibilidades en su día a día. Es importante que ver que nos evidencian cómo... La experiencia sensorial no solo permite ver tu alrededor de forma distinta que los estudiantes tienen en mente, sino que se posicionan ellos de forma diferente. Ya no se ven igual la ciudad. ¿Por qué? Porque ellos ya han tenido este break en este caso. También permite conectar y hacer nuevas relaciones. Claro, es interesante que luego, como educadores sociales, en este caso, cuando estén trabajando se den cuenta que la ciudad es, es, es un sitio importante para generar aprendizaje, que no estén dentro de a, salas o aulas cerradas, sino que utilicen el espacio de la ciudad como espacio de relación. Por lo tanto, es importante entender este concepto. Y por lo tanto, les eh, permitió repensar nuevas formas de conocimiento. ¿Qué pasó? Cuando ellos realizaron las cartografías, se dieron cuenta también que cada uno tenía su propio discurso, pero a la vez empezaron a ver la alteridad, a ver al otro, a entender un poco la lógica de su compañero y, por lo tanto, romper sus esquemas mentales y cerrados, sino que expandir y volver a generar nuevas relaciones. Por lo tanto, fijaros que aquí estas dos voces nos muestran un poco la relación con la perspectiva del otro, entender su propia lógica y cómo luego podemos generar conocimiento conjunto. Por último, el arte contemporáneo. ¿Qué les pasó? 
para eh, muchos de ellos no nunca habían estado en una, un centro de arte contemporáneo, por lo tanto eso fue ya un hándicap para ellos porque no sabían qué hacer y por lo tanto trabajar con arte contemporáneo fue uno abrir las puertas a nuevas posibilidades a que ellos vean como un recurso el arte para expandir y luego crear nuevas relaciones, nuevos diálogos. Por lo tanto, nuevas líneas de investigación para que ellos conecten con ya las experiencias de la ciudad. Un poco de resumen, de conclusiones. Ellos, los alumnos, entendieron que la ciudad no es un espacio estático, sino que es, es lleno de posibilidades, de recursos, de mil mil de, bueno, inputs que se conectan entre ellos como un rizoma, ¿no? por lo tanto es importante ese concepto. Vieron cómo empezar las clases fuera del aula y, y siempre intentar salir fuera de ellas fue también algo que en bueno, eh, bueno, en mejoraba un poco su proceso de, de formación. ¿no? Partir de la sensualidad o de la espacialidad, dos conceptos que ellos no conocían y que a partir de la unión de ambos empezaron a entender otros procesos, ya no de la asignatura propia, sino de ellos como personas que viven en la ciudad y, por lo tanto, crear nuevas relaciones con su día a día y sus formas de vida. Por lo tanto, bueno, la, el paradigma sensorial y la espacialidad, en este caso, entendiendo como third space, como un espacio de posibilidades, como un espacio de open mind, Ayudó, ayudó a ellos a generar nuevos procesos interesantes, ¿no? En este caso. Y hasta aquí la presentación. Gracias. Thank you so much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you, you all, because you were very strict with the time. And uh, now we have time for debate. And after four presentations, so different, but um, uh, so interrelated also, I think. Yeah. And um, in my opinion, so inspiring. Um, I'm sure that I, we, we will have some questions. So. Please. Hello, Richard Neyman from uh, Wars University of Life Science. I have the one question about those, uh, those theaters in Istanbul. I'm not sure if I understood everything clear and correct, but uh, as I understood, it's uh, quite of independent movement between the inhabitants of, of Istanbul, of Turkey, which is independent from main uh, governmental narrative, and it gives the people a chance to show up the problems, the real problems, and their real life, their, their, their own history. And in the beginning, uh, you have shown the uh, diagram that uh, this theater also got, or are trying to get, uh, foreign financial from uh, associations like uh, Getty Institute and British Council. And uh, my question is, uh, if, if, you are, if you think or if you are not afraid, if this financial from these institutions, which are not independent because we, they are dependent from uh, their uh, home uh, governments, if it's not a danger for the independence, real independence, of this theater. Thank you. Hello, uh, my question is for Daniel. Is it okay if I ask in English? Okay. Um, I'm just wondering if I wanted to know what age uh, were the students that you taught and if there were any negative responses on their part because I taught a similar class at the university in Rio and uh, I sometimes got a lot of complaints from my students and I don't know if there was some walking involved. We, we used to go around the center of Rio and they had a, a notebook and they had to do some drawing because it was the architecture and urbanism course. And, uh, you know, it was, they were the, the freshman students. It was the first semester of them at the university and they, were, they wanted to do the projects. So I don't know if they were partially lazy or if it was too hot, but a lot of them complained about this experience. So I wonder if you had a similar 
experience of students complaining about it too. It's just a, a curiosity. Um, it's not quite a question, it's a bit more of a comment, but I just um, was wondering if any of you, um, particularly the um, Istanbul Theatre and also um, your work in Brussels, um, are familiar with Social Acupuncture, which is a book written by Dan Daniel O'Donnell, a Canadian theatre maker. And he's a bit of an anarchist, and I don't know, like your work is far more participatory, so you mightn't necessarily um, like the work he produces, but the idea is that small, um, small scale, um, often uh, with small budget art projects in, in sites of tension um, in urban spaces can have this quite beautiful impact of loosening some of those tensions. So it's not that artists can in any way fix the world's problems, but that they can loosen the knots in the back of the, of the, of the city with social acupuncture. Yes, thank you for this question because uh, it's the conflictual part also of my PhD overall. Uh, I think maybe the answer for this lies behind the conflictual, conflictual nature of contemporary arts overall because uh, it has clear relations with the global capitalism for sure and all of these actors, but also the same um, field, contemporary arts, also is highly related with these activist practices uh, so when I mention independence, so mainly uh, I refer in being independent from Turkish state uh, in the case of the censorships and making visible this kind of stories. Uh, but in terms of for sure funded by Goethe Institute or British Council, in this context, yes, they create for them uh, a, a free space. But still uh, there is this conflict also. Yeah. In English, so well. the age it's 20 more or less, so it's a high education. So it's the second course or the second level in the degree of social educator, and so in the resistance of the relation between this subject or the, the contents between these actions, yes, a lot of uh, because. Uh, why? Because there are, uh, it's not the typical methodology, so it's sometimes it's strange, sometimes the, idea, the ideas are not clear for the students, so yes, absolutely, but um, it's step by step, so the students understand that it's, the life is a process, so it, we try to make the, uh, make the best always, but step by step. So they understand more or less the situation, the, the all kind of inputs that, that they receive. So, well, in the, uh, from, in, al principio sí, se recibió bastante con resistencia, pero luego ya se empezó a abrir la mente, ¿no?, y se empezó a generar bien procesos. Pero sí, tienes razón que al principio es difícil, difícil. Uh, so just about the projects in, in Brussels, uh, if you could t tell us a little bit more about uh, how do you get people to participate? I'm really thinking about the first steps, like coming and s explaining what are you doing and in what language. Is it common that people speak, do you speak French? Is it, does everyone, especially in these neighborhoods I know around the center of Brussels there are a million languages being spoken. And in relation to that, uh, also as, as someone who does uh, uh, community projects and artistic projects uh, back home, I figured that also after years of moving around and after having a, you know, similar experiences, doing this also made me, f made me feel more at home. So what are your feelings about this? You know, it's also, does this make you feel more at home in Brussels, doing this with the, with the community? What is the connection there? Thanks. Um, thanks for the question. Um, about the languages, it's uh, actually when I came here at the conference, I feel like in Brussels because everyone speaks their language and they don't care and people have to understand or not. <laughs> so um, 
I was actually very shy to, to go and I understand Dutch and French, but I don't actively speak. Uh, I have translators for the written texts, but not for the verbal. Um, but people are actually tolerant and maybe you don't reach very deep philosophical discussions, but you can have a connection with them. Um, and in a, working in a Turkish neighborhood uh, or Moroccan neighborhood, Arab neighborhood, people are more open to me than uh, maybe a Flemish person, but at the same time I'm, I'm in a very peculiar position because I collaborate with a Flemish community center, I have a Flemish funding, and I work together with a Flemish university, which is a bit th the evil because they have a lot of money. Um, so I have to be very careful. Um, how do I reach people? It's a valid question because first, the first workshops that I showed, or the talk shops, and the mappings, they were through invitations and flyers and nice communication methods, but they reach a very small percentage of people and usually the white educated ones. Uh, so this is why we decided at a point to stop this communication for the moment and go to uh, another method. Um, so there are two approaches for me. One is where you are open and invite people and people come, and the other approach is where you intervene and you provoke people. So this is what the oven was doing. It was occupying and hacking urban space and it provoked people. Uh, it was not so big they could stay or go. It, it was not annoying them, uh, but it had a very different impact. Also, we would never reach those people through our f flyers, which were in the library and in the school. Um, and if I feel more at home, definitely. And uh, also I feel I have quite a lot of responsibility at the moment. and. Um, you, you get to hear a lot of personal stories, so the question is how do you deal with this material that you have when people give to you so much of themselves, what do you give them back? I don't want to be the one who, who feeds my artist ego and takes from people to put something in my portfolio, not at all. So. The question was not directed to me, but I want to add something related to that urban acupuncture and tactical urbanism ideas that uh, we have been working on several different projects in Istanbul uh, to do small scale interventions with the community and look for requests coming from community to find that uh, low budget and mostly temporary solutions for their needs, not uh, to, uh, to resolve a conflict mainly, but there might be a conflict between the municipality and the, the public and everything. And I think in Istanbul case, it's, uh, it's very nice to do it, but because it's uh, most of the neighborhoods have a long history of uh, conflicts and, uh, and interventions and big interventions made uh, top down, uh, there's an issue of trust. So as a designer, it's hard to, to um, intervene in a situation and uh, be like a, in a position of an educator or like um, stimulator. And I think in the case of Istanbul, it works better if it's a long established uh, uh, community organization and NGO. And uh, I think they are more successful in those cases of working with the community and establishing trust than making uh, punctual uh, design interventions, let's say. But I would like to like, email or uh, send you a list of the, the projects done around 2010 uh, in Istanbul, and there were some very exciting ones. No? <laughs> I suppose that you want to go for lunch. <laughs> so um, I only want to say that um, it was a pleasure for me to make part of this table. <laughs> and uh, I want to congratulate you for your work. It was so inspiring to see so, so different works uh, going going on and um, so so good also so thank you for your attention and for your presence and have a good lunch <laughs>